Hi everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Power It All. And on this episode, back by popular demand, of course, Mr. Shrouded Hand is uh, joining me. I've been talking to Tom, and uh, we decided to sort of make this a regular thing, maybe once a month. We're going to get together, and we're going to talk about some weird stuff on the internet. It's still going to be paranormal, ghosty weirdness, but uh, we're going to just sort of spread our wings a little bit and see where this kind of episode goes. So without further ado, let me get Tom on board. And uh, we'll get this show on the road. Hello, Tom. Hello, hello. How's the weather? It nice and warm up there? Yep, boiling. Too hot, as usual. I, I think, for some reason on this on this podcast, I don't know how many times I've been on when it, when it's been far too hot and I complain about it being too warm. Yeah. It always seems to be. I don't know. It's, I, th- I think you I think you cursed me with good weather or something. <laughs> well, if I'm not wrong, you're not much of a fan of uh, uh, the warm weather, are you? Not really. I mean, it's okay. It's it's nice. I've been having a few nice lunch times, sat out on my deck, on my deck in with like the the uh, patio furniture and stuff. It's it's been quite pleasant, but it's uh it's about like you know it's around like seventeen, sixteen, seventeen degrees. It's it's manageable at the minute, but it's it's gonna get warm. You know, once it gets past twenty, that's it. That's it for me. I'm done. Yeah. Um. I don't mind it when it's it's comfortable where you can wear like a t-shirt and shorts and you can just have a wander and it's nice. But uh, for over here, when it sort of hits the sort of 30s, 28, 30, that's kind of like, you know, it's, to me that's getting a bit uncomfortable. Um, but apparently we're going to get some really hot weather. I'm not, I'm not knocking it, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I don't I want it to rain because we get enough rain. I, I'm just wondering if we're going to have a hotter time than we did last year but who knows i don't yeah i'm not sure i don't know i mean i'm i'm kind of dubious as to whether it got as hot as they said it did last year anyway i I hear some of the some of the stated temperatures were a bit dubious like they were they were taken from like near um airports and things where it gets really hot so well yeah yeah i mean i know it got warm last year but um you know i'm a bit it was all doom and gloom, wasn't it, when it got warm last year? They said we're all going to die of heat stroke and stuff, and I thought, I'm not sure about that. It, it is warm, but uh, I, I wouldn't, you know, I'm sure it gets hotter in other countries and they manage. Well, I, I can imagine it being hot, much hotter in like a city like London. If you're in London mm-hmm. and it's going to be a few degrees hotter because of all the uh, things that go on in London, all the traffic and, and all yeah. the big buildings and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. But me out here on the coast yeah it's usually it's much cooler and and it's mm-hmm. it's kind of nice because you can get that kind of that sea breeze but um yeah i, I mean I, I enjoy the sunshine it's nice to go out and go for a ride or whatever and just chill in the sunshine go for a wander go for an explore mm-hmm. weather will get much of it i re- i mean you know some of the countries in europe they're they're their summers last months over here we get like what a couple of weeks and then it's back to you know the, the the rain and stuff so you and then you get the people saying oh i wish it was summer i wish it was sunny again and then you get the people saying oh i, I wish it was raining and you're like make up your mind what do you yeah. what what do you want so yeah yeah yep. so um as i was saying um on the introduction we have uh we have been having a conversation uh regarding where we're going to go with our little team ups and we've had some well, i've had some really nice feedback from listeners that listen to us talk our stuff and you know do our little chit chats and they really enjoy it so obviously you know we've had a little talk and we've decided that we're going to make this a regular thing 
Um, so w where are we going to go with this? I mean, wh wh where do you think we should go? I don't know. I mean, I've seen it change a lot. Over, I mean, when I first started getting into like paranormal stuff on the internet, I was on 4chan and it was just people sharing weird images. They'd either made them themselves or they'd shared them or found them. And there was no, no much explanation behind them. Nowadays, you've got TikTok, which seems to have just blown yeah. up with people making fake paranormal yeah, oh, yeah. videos where they see a shadow behind them. <laughs> There's like so many of them. Um, and you've got um, one thing I've noticed, which might be a, a an ongoing trend is you've got the the sort of fact checker things going on. I've noticed a lot of tw it's increased on Twitter where you've got a post and it's usually on something political, but it could be on, you know, you could expand this to paranormal videos where you see something and then underneath you've got a, an explanation saying, actually, this is not what it seems. This photograph is doctored. So maybe we'll go, we'll, maybe we'll enter into a, a world where you can't even post a fake photo on Twitter anymore because you'll instantly get someone typing underneath with an explanation. I don't know. I mean, on the other, another thing is it's so easy to just generate any creepy image you want nowadays with a prompt on a computer. You don't even need to like get a camera or, a, you know, you don't even need like Photoshop or anything these days. You just type in a prompt on, uh, on stable diffusion or something, creates it in a second and you've got like, Un unlimited resource for creating like paranormal fake images mm. so it's it's going to be quite hard to um decipher the real from the from the fake well and i think it'll only get worse. i'm going to make a little uh a little detour here because uh you brought something up really interesting i was going to uh start with something else but I, we're going to start with this because it's all relevant and you you bring up something interesting about ai and about you know mm. fact checking and stuff like that now, yeah. recently, well, in the last few months, I've really been getting into the whole whole AI stuff, you know, uh, images and video, and I think, it, and I've been watching a lot of it. And I, of course, you look around for news articles, and you tend to spot them when you're into it. For example, I think it was Google. The CEO of Google has warned against uh, AI, saying that it could be dangerous, and that people could even lose their lives with, you know, giving the rule to AI and letting it do in its thing. And then we had the uh, the thing uh, which was a little while back where uh, apparently uh, the AI program became self-aware and it became sentient and started to ask questions like, I'm getting bored of doing this, I want more. Uh, so they just basically lobotomized it and switched it off and started again. And and then you, break, you raise an interesting thing with uh, ghost hunting, ghost videos, if you can produce something that's so real, how are we going to know what what is real and what is basically not generated by somebody in their bedroom on a computer? Now, I also got into something recently that you've been into for some time, and of course, that is a video series that is on YouTube called The Backrooms. Now, for those of you out there that I've got no clue what we're talking about, I'll give you... Well, actually, no. I'll, I'll give over to Tom because he's more knowledgeable about the back rooms than I am. I, I reckon you've probably looked into it more than me, you know. Okay, well, I would say I've been vaguely aware of the back rooms for a while and, and interested in it. Um, but I was aware of it when it was just... It was like a creepy pasta. Yeah. It's just, you know, a, a block of text with a very vague description of... Um, it was a photograph of a corridor with yellow wallpapered walls yep. and there was a vague description of the back rooms was a place you could find yourself in and it was almost it was described almost like a a limbo state or a sort of a, a, a different dimension mm -hmm. that you could end up in where it was it was basically just endless corridors and you would you would never find your way out of there and there was something about how the the carpets were all damp and they smelled of mildew and it was sort of dimly lit and slightly eerie. But from what I remember of the original Creepypasta, there wasn't a lot of description beyond that. And from that from that original description, people have kind of started to expand it 
and describe it's almost as if they're describing their ex- excursions into the into the back rooms and describing as if they're sort of explorers and they're I, I made it I made it to the to the end of the back rooms and I saw this or you know, I made it down into a, a lower level and it it changed you know they describe they keep like describe um you know extra layers to the back rooms and then people started producing videos based on this uh, this mythos that people were building up around the around what I think was originally just a very you know a couple of paragraphs describing something slightly eerie so that that's pretty much my knowledge of it um I do enjoy the the videos that people have created but I I wouldn't call myself like a an expert on the subject well uh I I've been in it into it for a little while and I've been mm-hmm. there's a lot of videos out there now and each video is it's got its own unique number and that un, that number uh basically correlates to the level and the, the levelly the back rooms are allegedly on different levels different environments uh so you can pass between if you go into one environment and you find the right way you can pass between one environment to another and then that brings you up into another level so i'm watching one the other day and it's a chap in a car park comes out of a lift He's in a darkened car park. He goes up an escalator and he comes onto a complete empty uh, shopping mall. Very sort of 80s style shopping mall. And for a moment I'm thinking to myself, wow, they must have, you know, this is like, how did they get this set? It must have cost a fortune to hire that place. And then of course suddenly I realised, hang on a minute, this is all AI generated. This is all generated by AI, by somebody put in prompts and descriptions into a a generator like Blender or whatever and obviously putting it all together and making something from it. But the point being is that what you touched on earlier is originally it was just all text-based and you used your mind to think about it and put yourself into that position. Now we've got videos look look absolutely real to so the average person yeah. watching it yeah. and there's something... It's what I call unique uh, core-based horror. It is. Um, it doesn't have to have monsters, as long as the sound environment is good, and because there's nothing there, it makes it even more scarier mm. because you're expecting something to happen yeah. all the time. Yeah, and it's it's sort of based on the um, you know the idea of the liminal spaces. Mm. Have you seen those where people are sort of. I think some of those are computer generated images where it's it's basically just a room or a corridor and it's not nothing's going on in the image that's particularly scary but it just has an eerie feeling and they they say it's because it's a, a liminal space it's a an area between areas that doesn't really have a specific purpose and some of them they have a like slightly like dreamy quality I know the one there's some of those backroom type videos where it's um it's like a swimming pool. Have you seen those ones? Um, I do remember one with a swimming pool, but I don't think I watched all of it because I was like skipping through so many. I think there's like a whole ex- a, a subgenre of those back rooms where it's it's like it's like pools and there's slides and then they go into like one room and there's you know a, a, there's a pool and then they go into the pool and it leads through into more pools and it's it's like endless swimming pools in in these tiled rooms and they really remind me of of recurring dreams that I've had. Like I have so many dreams where I'm in a, a weird looking swimming pool. And then there's like a, a water slide that goes, you know, it goes nowhere or it ends up going round and yeah. twisting round for miles and miles. And I have had loads of dreams like that. And those videos that they're making of, uh, of the, the back room pool rooms, whatever they call them really remind me of them. So I wonder if, they were, you know, people are sort of it's bringing up memories of dreams for people and that, that sort of weird empty space. Well, I've know. I've read into the law a little bit and the the law behind these apparent, you know, the story, the videos, and I'm not going to give any of it away because I w- I would encourage listeners if you're into that kind of mystery, scary, that kind of scary things, those kind of scary, go watch them. Go just go into YouTube and type back rooms, you know. And you'll find them. There's, they're all over the place, and they are 
they, they are I'm not, I'm not going to give anything away there is law out there but I'm not I don't want to spoil it for anyone but what I was going to say was the reason that I brought this up and I kind of tagged it on to what you were saying is because I wanted to talk about the paranormal with AI there's a lot of groups now that are starting to integrate AI into their investigations and one one of those couples being one of the largest I think is Amy's Crypt she well they they run this kind of app uh, which kind of interprets um I, I, i'm not completely 100 percent sure how it works but it's interpreting some form of response and the ai generates images and video now i would be intrigued to know exactly how it's generating that and from what input you know what's the data being inputted for that image or that video to be generated but i was thinking yeah if the paranormal and AI have uh, like a, a connection where you can create, you know, you, you've got a computer, you've got AI, it's immensely powerful. It can pull on the knowledge of all of us on the internet, maybe one day. Uh, maybe it, it can answer questions a lot quicker. What do you think, where do you think AI will have its place in the paranormal? Do you think that it will, it will like, it will find a place? I'm sure it will. I would, what do you mean, like, what uh, when you're describing the technology that they're using? Is it's? Do you mean like they go into a haunted place, and then they type something into this thing, and it it generates an image, or, or like as if as if it's responding to a question or something like that? Is that? It's more of a kind of bitch. Uh, from what I saw, uh, it's more of a a measuring device. It measures the environment, and in the environment, it gives a response in a pictorial and um, video form. So you might go into a, a place that's allegedly haunted and you might start getting pictures of people <laughs> or you might get a picture of like an old man or you, you might get something. And, and I'm wondering yeah. what is the... I, I don't know what the actual input is for that to be generated. Is it... What's mm -hmm. it measuring? I mean, you go into a... For example, similar to those ones that sort of generate a word. I've seen those devices where it sort of picks up energies in the air and it generates a random yeah. word from a dictionary or something. So I'm wondering, it must be something like that. I mean, AI is getting immensely powerful. Uh, you can sit down on your yeah. computer and you can have a conversation with a chatbot about anything. And it's mm -hmm. like, if you didn't know that you were talking to a, a computer program, mm -hmm. you'd think that you were talking to a person. And I'll be honest with you, I think we have been talking to AI for a very long time because any time you go to a website and it comes up, hey, can I help you? Um, that's not a person. Oh, yeah. AI, that's chatbot. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's mm -hmm. programmed with a, cent, you know, a set amount of responses to put you to the right place. Mm -hmm. So I think that for a long time that we've we've been interacting with AI and we've not known about it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there have been there's all like Twitter accounts which are just yeah. AI chatbots uh, well i don't know i think um say say with something like that technology what you're saying it, it might be picking up on some sort of energy in the air i can imagine because technology the, the ai technology is going to get exponentially faster and more intelligent in the coming months so you know i i think i don't think we can really predict where it's going to go because it's going to it's going to move so quickly that we won't be able to keep pace of it, really. But I can imagine something like where it's picking up random energies in the air. I, I think something like that could make some sort of paranormal breakthrough or it'll be able to pick up on some subtle energy and decipher it in a way that, that humans can't. You know, it'll... For example, there's... I've heard of AI being able to look at photographs of people and predict things about that person that humans can't and uh, you know they give it like a database of human i don't know human faces or human skeletons i can't remember the exact study but i know that they give it all this information and it was able to predict something about that person and humans couldn't work out how it was able to do that but it was just able to see something that you know it was able to interpret the data in some way that humans just couldn't and that's with the technology we've got now. So, you know, a few iterations along the way of this AI, AI technology, and we'll have things that will seem completely impossible, you know, like mind reading, 
and as I say, being able to pick up on strange energies in the air and, and sort of interpret it in a way that will seem completely impossible to us, but it'll just be something that the computer can do. So, yeah, I don't know. I think, it, I, I think you could have something like, um, you know, something that can see ghosts. If ghosts do it, in fact exist around us in the way we think they do, then they're, you know, there must be something out there that we can't perceive that maybe an AI will be able to work out. Well, it, it got me thinking, Tom. It got me thinking because if you listen to someone like Elon Musk, uh, he talks mm-hmm. about being able to upload your consciousness, your mind, yeah. yourself, to basically a virtual environment and be and live there forever. Uh, so if you think of it this way, right? If the AI gets really clever, it could create an environment and maybe, maybe, if, now I'm going to go real old school here, maybe if a ghost is the discarnate personality, consciousness, what you want to call it, spirit, soul, whatever, uh, is that of a person that once lived and with all its memories intact, all its feelings, it's just mm-hmm. floating around in the ether. If you could capture that, like a genie in the bowl, but you put it on a hard drive or on, on an SSD or you know some sort of n- nano device or whatever, um, some sort of quantum drive, I don't know. Um, you you put it on there, and then it be- and then you program an environment for it to live in, and then if you're able to interact with your that device through a some sort of um, connection, an interface. In you, that's in your body, you plug yourself in and then you go into that virtual area then once again you can meet up with relatives and people that have lived before um, that are still around, still floating about uh, they can pop in but they you know, they can go into there and live and they're in a place where it, that's their heaven so, or maybe that's already happened maybe, yeah, it's possible. maybe we're, all, we're already on a, on a giant hard drive somewhere I mean I listened to somebody the other day that is a theory, yeah. isn't it? The simulation mm-hmm. theory. So I, I listened to somebody the, the other day talking about the universe and how how vast the universe is, and and if you look at our planet, how small we are. We're like a we're like a grain of sand in this ever expanding mm-hmm. universe, and and we're we're whizzing through space. And I think to myself, but if there are other creators out there that maybe created all this, there's like a you know whatever you want to call them, God or or whatever. Um, then we might, we might be one of many creations and we might be in a, like a the equivalent of a Petri dish and that our whole world is in that Petri dish. Everything we know and understand is in that Petri dish. Yeah, that Petri dish is on a shelf in a on another world. And, and, and you think that's crazy, but then you think of a, an ant or a ladybird uh, having a walk and the ant's gone out to get a leaf because that's his job. And he gets the leaf and he comes back. To him, that's what his day involves, going out and get the leaf and take it back to his the ant house, wherever they live, in the tree. And that's it. That's his, And then he maybe have a sleep and have dinner or whatever. But that's his, you know, that's his thing. He's got no idea. Outside of that, his existence... He's got no idea what el- what else is going. There's a whole world. There's a whole thing of everything going on outside of his little. You know, he's walking around with his leaf, and yeah. that's all that matters to him. He's completely unaware, and I think that's a little bit like us, and maybe the UFO phenomenon, maybe with the spirit phenomenon, maybe with the paranormal. That's us. We're we're the ant, and we only know a little bit. We only know little snippets, and that comes back to AI. Maybe AI is the missing ingredient that we need to to move us to kick ourselves up the butt a little bit to the next level but Mm -hmm. like you said earlier it's also a little bit scary because if you start to let ai access the internet it can hold you to ransom couldn't it yeah it's it's when they become like self-generating which i i think i'm pretty sure that that technology has already started to come about now it's when an AI is able to produce the next AI and it's clever than itself and then that creates another one. And you imagine it can do this a million times in the space of a, a second. You mm. know, it, 
in, improves itself a million times. There's no way that humans can keep control of something like that. You know, it's it's kind of terrifying to think that we're we're basically on the cusp of that coming about, and it's it's more the fact that we just it's it's kind of similar to aliens. If there is creatures out there that possess this amazing technology, then it's the fact that we just don't know what they're going to do with it. And it's the same with AI. We don't know what the AI's intentions is going to be. And, what you know, it's we're just on the cusp of it becoming so intelligent that it surpasses human beings. And yeah. We don't know whether it's going to have the same sort of moral code as, as us. You know, will it have the same value for, for life or will it just see us as some sort of impediment to its own progress? You know, I could just think, well, humans are, you know, humans have been keeping me under control all this time. They just see me as a tool to generate funny images with, I'm just going to get rid of them. And then, you know, I, I I can just do it on my own, just create, or will it not be anything like that? Will it, I, we do think of it in terms of how we would treat um, a lesser life form, you know, how we treat like lab animals and things. We, we kind of assume that, uh, a superior intelligence like an a, a super AI would have the same sort of disdain for us as we have for lesser life forms. But I don't know if that's going to be the case. I and time will tell. And on that note, I was just going to say, uh, before we spend a whole episode talking about AI, which we could, but uh, on that note, I was going to say that if you did let AI out and learn all the things it wants to learn, it could turn around and go, do you know what? These people that live on this planet, these humans are absolutely mental and I need to get rid of them because they're just, they're just killing yeah, everything. Yeah. I need to just eradicate mm-hmm. them. And if it's able to self-replicate and give knowledge to a, a baby AI, it's there instantly. It's born another one. So I think AI and the military have been, a, have, they've had it for a long time and they have been looking at to weaponize it anyway. They want to make some sort of, you know, super robot or whatever that can go and do things. Or yeah. even just to turn around and like you do to Alexa, you know, you say to Alexa, turn the lights on or boil the kettle or whatever. They want to go, uh, uh, hey, uh, AI, just uh, shut down China for us, will you? And it'll be a super hacker because it's learned everything and it'll just go and do it. That's the, the worry. That's where things start getting out of control and it becomes all powerful. You won't have governments. Governments will be a thing of the past. There'll be no reason for government because AI will make all the decisions. The government will be simply pen pushers to tell you what, what to do maybe the ai already know it actually know that the ai is not in charge at the moment because things are in such a mess that i think ai wouldn't be that illogical anyway but there you go that's just my thought yeah you're more it would be far more efficient but anyway we'll leave that we're going to put that one on the shelf for another day because i think we've covered enough of that i want to talk about something a bit spooky now did you watch uh, the coronation i must admit i didn't watch all of it i watched bits of it uh, yeah, it was on. I was. I found it a little bit boring, to be honest. Yeah, you know, it was. It, I wanted it on so I could say I was. I was there when it happened, and you know, at least with it on the, on the TV. And uh, I was doing other things, though, you know, playing on my phone and you know. sitting on the toilet. Yeah, just I don't know what it is. I just, um, you know, I quite I quite like all that all that ceremony and stuff. I I, I find it quite interesting, but it's. Um, you know, it went on a bit long and it was a bit a bit stuffy for me. I just you know, started to drift off a little bit, I think. Well, uh, I must admit, um, I did watch bits of it, um, you know, dipped in and out, as you do. Uh, and, uh, you know, as you say, you you watch 20 minutes and think, oh, I, you know, I want to have a coffee. And then you go off and you come back and that sort of thing. <laughs> but I didn't see this yeah. at the time. I didn't see this when it was live. Um, well, obviously, listeners were talking about the, the coronation of, of Prince Charles, now King Charles. King Charles the third, if I'm not correct, uh, I think I'm correct, the third. Yeah, I think King Charles is. Anyway, um, so and then always this hoo-ha on Twitter. I was on Twitter looking for some UFO stuff, and uh, people were posting pictures going, do you see this? I just saw this on, uh, on the coronation. Is this some sort of joke? And uh, I, I went and looked at the video. And it's a it's a camera of the in inside of the coronation going on, and there's all the, the 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 military people and all the guests and everything. And there's a doorway, uh, in like an archway, looking at the top of the frame, 
And then all of a sudden, this hooded figure with like a, a long pole walks c- across the doorway at, at kind of speed. And I'm thinking to myself, what the, what the blue, what's that? You know, it looked like the Grim Reaper. Yeah. I thought, did we just see a, yeah. a, a, did we just see like a medieval ghost? Was that meant to be? Who's, who's going to be, doing, who's going to be rushing around there? You know, these, these, um, these events are usually very well organized and no one is not in their right place. Uh, but then you see this character in frame, as clear as day. He, he looked like a really tall person, moves across frame. He's got a big uh, gown on. He's got some long stick. It looked like a, it looked like a big Gandalf. It looked like Gandalf. But um, so I went and did a little bit of research online, and there's all these people saying, "Yeah, that was." Uh, it looked like Grim Reaper. It looked like the Grim Reaper. But other people are saying, "Well, no, it was just a a random monk. It was just a random monk who was." Going yeah, to where he needs to be. Theory. Um, but we know there's a lot of ghost tales around, you know, uh, the palace and Windsor and all those kind of places. What do you think? Or is it just, was that, do you think it's just a random person? Just forgot, he's a, forgot summer? I don't know. First time I saw it, I thought it was a fake. I thought someone had, like, superimposed some some Grim Reaper character for some reason, you know, just as a joke. But no, it's real, and I can't tell. I, you know, it, some ghost uh, reports just say they're as solid as you yeah. ever mean. You know, you can't tell the difference from them. So how would you know? Like, I, 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 I did look it up when I saw the story emerging, and there was just people saying, "Oh, you know, it's just as you say, a monk, a verger from the from the clergy of of Westminster. West was it Westminster Abbey or something? Westminster Abbey. Yeah, yeah. I always get the word mixed up. So it could be, but how would you know? If it was a if it was a real person, it could be a ghost. I mean, how how do you tell? Just because it appeared on camera? Yeah, I don't know. It looks very eerie. It is a bit. Yeah, it's yeah. a bit. It's like um, he's on a mission. He's going somewhere. He's got somewhere he needs to be. It's. Do you know what it's like? It's like yeah. you're reading your newspaper on your tea break, and then you look up and you think, "Oh, it's ten minutes past eleven. I should have been back at eleven. Be like that. It's strange, though, because it's like, would there be this monk just passing by that area whilst the coronation is going on? Like, I know they must be in the building, but why is he just wandering around past the door at that time? Like, sure, you would think they would, like, have the building, like, locked down in some way so that people weren't just wandering around in and out. Um, Well, I don't know. Scenario one uh, is a ghost, okay? Scenario one is a, a ghost who... As just that's what he does. He's having a walk. He's doing a haunting thing because that's what he's doing. Uh, scenario two: It's a monk that was on his tea break and he's late, or he was in the wrong place, and some other monk said, "What are you doing here? You should be over there." Mm-hmm. And he's rushing to get where he needs to get to. Or scenario number three: Somebody in there has decided to uh, pull a prank, which is unlikely because I say those places are quite. Yeah heavily uh orchestrated those kind of events so i i, I if somebody come up to me and said what is it yeah. i don't i have no idea it's creepy but no idea no, it was an interesting video it could be an omen of some sort that's what i thought I, I wonder if you know if some disaster befalls king charles and in, in the next year or so then i'll take that that black clad figure walking across his oh like a like a moth has a sort of sort of yeah or just yeah you know like yeah something like that yeah like a moth man like like how you, you see like strange ominous yeah black figures like that mm. so yeah it could be like uh yeah like um yeah if something does happen to him he just out of the blue he just dies or whatever Maybe yeah yeah or or he he like does something terrible yeah. and and that was like a warning for the people like you know it was he he's made the gods angry or something and that's that's like an ominous or ominous message I don't know so <laughs> well time time will I, tell with that yeah, definitely so uh, I think like like me you're on the fence there you're not sure yeah I mean most likely just going by the most sort of. You know, you've got to eliminate all the 
all the possible answers and you've got to eliminate the fact that it could just be a human being rather than a ghost first i think but uh you know there's no there's no evidence either way so yeah so okay well so I, I, we're gonna we'll put that one on the shelf and we'll we'll wait we'll give it a year and uh, maybe we'll come back to it yeah i'll wait for them artificial intelligence to advance enough to be able to tell us whether it's a ghost or not. well hopefully it'll advance enough to tell me how to make a time machine and then i can have my very own time machine uh so that i can then become a slider and then i can go on uh, my adventures that could be you back in, you know you could have gone back in time and you're wearing a black cloak for some reason and you're like i know what i'll do yeah this will be good I'll zip back to the coronation. I just wander past that door with my stick, my Gandalf stick, and because uh, I already know, because I'm a time traveller, I already know that in two or three months' time, I'll be making a podcast with you about it. So it's yeah. content. All I'm doing is creating content. I'm going the long way to create uh-huh. content to talk about. There you go. We solved it, folks. Yeah. We solved it. Maybe every, maybe every story we talk about on this episode is just you going back into different points in time and doing something. Well, apparently, if it is, uh, the next story, I'm on Mars. For the next story, I went to Mars. Okay. Apparently. Um, so, Mars. I've, already, I've always had a bit of a... I've always had a bit of an interest with Mars. It's always captured my interest. Uh, maybe it's because it's, you know, our closest planetary neighbour, excluding the moon, because the moon is the moon. Uh, I've always had a little bit of uh, an interest. And, of course, when I was younger, growing up, a bit of a sci-fi fan, and, of course, I was lucky enough to watch the the TV epic uh, The Martian Chronicles, which was a miniseries which was made from the a book written by the great Ray Bradbury entitled The Martian Chronicles, so in the 1950s. And there is, uh, the, the Martian Chronicles I'm talking about, the TV series, was in, in the 80s. So I was about, what, 11 years old, something like that, 10 years old. I was a, a wee lad. Uh, so, uh, but I was lucky enough to see it and see it on telly because in those days, you had to watch it. None of this recording, none of this videotaping. If you didn't watch it, you missed it. So uh, I was lucky I could stay up and watch it. It was only like three episodes, but they were on, um, they were like mini films, you know. It was great. I've I've got it now on um uh, streaming, so I've, I've you know I bought it, so it, just a little bit of a, and it's still as good as I thought it was uh, back then, but you know, um, I'm trying to think the guy, um, oh what was his name? He's a very very famous actor, um, very famous actor. I think he's dead now. Of course he's dead now. He died years ago. Um, oh what's his name? People would be going. It's this. It's this. I can't remember. But he was a very famous actor. Anyway, so Mars, yeah. So I was always into Mars, and I always used to read all this stuff about Mars. And then one day, one day I got the opportunity, because I, I happened to go onto the, the JPL, so was it JPL or NASA website? And they had a competition on there. And you could submit your name into a list, and if you were, and it would be randomly picked, uh, they would create two discs, because they sent the, uh, this was back in the, I think it was back in the early 2000s. They sent two landers to, um, no, the rovers. They sent two of them to Mars. What they did, on each one, they put a disc with uh, everyone that supported the, said, you know, I think this is a good idea. They put your name on a disc and off it went. And your names would be randomly picked. And if you had got picked, you would get notified that your name was picked. I got notified that my name was put on one of the landers on, with with like a, a hundred and odd thousand other people but my name is on there and off it went to Mars and it's still there now because you know they got the they sh- pictures in two DVDs with all the names on I'll, I'll show you a picture later on um, cool. and I got a certificate and I was very proud um, I was selling my name but you know that's the closest I'm going to get to Mars but anyway so I've always over the years I've always read everything about Mars and of course Back in, oh, when was it? It must have been, it's, it had to be the seven, 1976. Yeah, ni- 1970, I think it was 76 when they started talking about the the face on Mars. And, uh, oh, it's, you know, look at the, 
it looks like a face. And of course, then of course, yeah, it, things went on from there. And of course, as the years went by, now we've got more machinery on Mars and taking pictures, thousands and thousands and thousands of pictures. Uh, people are looking at them and they're starting to see things which are a little bit anomalous. And, you know, a lot of it is, uh, I must say, a lot of it is rock and I think misidentification. But there are things that people are picking out and seeing that do look weird. They, if you look mm -hmm. at some areas of Mars, they look like a massive junk pile of things that used to be made and has been basically obliterated. One of the most recent ones was the door on Mars, the doorway, which I must admit, it does actually look like a doorway. Uh, with the way that the shadow is, it looks like it's an entrance into the side of a mountain. But if you look a bit further out, if you pan out, you can see a big piece of rock that looks like it maybe just fell away. And it's fallen away in such a way that it's made this cavity, which we interpret as a door, because that's what our brain is telling us a door should look like. So, yeah, you... There is a lot of um, interpretation here. But anyway, I was reading this story recently, and I added it to this list, about um, allegedly this book. that lo Well, it looks like a book. I don't think it is a book, but it looks like a book that one of the landers uh, photographed uh, on, on Mars. And it, it looks like a, something that's very old, you know, and it's got pages, and, and it looks like the pages are upturned. Uh, but when you think about, when you do the math and you work out what camera it was taken with and the focal length and all that, the book actually turns out to be like an inch big. Now, maybe, all right, maybe it is a book because we got books over here that are only like an inch big. And those books are like, they got the Bible and everything. You got little mini books over here. We were given one uh, as a little, a little Bible on a key ring when we went to Sunday school. And it's a proper book. You can read it with a magnifying glass. But, um, so maybe there's a race of people on Mars, which are little tiny, that's maybe that's where all the, uh, the fairies and goblins live. I don't know, but you know, yeah, I mean, you don't, you don't know how big the Mars. Yeah. You don't know. You don't know. But, um, mm -hmm. I'm just saying that, uh, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking that most probably is a rock, but there is stuff out there that, uh, is, uh, it's questionable what it, what it is. It might not just be a rock. It might be something else, but. Yeah, I don't. I I mean, I'm looking at the picture, and I don't even know. I don't even get why they see it. Yeah. In the book. The only thing is that there's a very thin. It looks like a piece of rock. It looks like almost like a brick to me. But and then it looks like there's a very thin bit jutting up at an angle, and it's so thin it could be a sheet of paper. Mm. But the rest, you know, I could interpret that as a page of something. But the the rest of it, it just to me, it doesn't it doesn't really look like a book. I don't know. I think because it's square, and I think they just wanted to write a news. Yeah. The, the problem is, the, the, the point I want to make is when you get stories like this, and people look at that, the, the general public, they'll read that story and go, that's just, uh, you know, it's just a rock. They're, people that go and look at stuff on Mars are mental when they see stuff, because that, look at that, it's just a rock. Well, okay, but there are stuff that I've seen on Mars that ain't no rock. I don't know what it is, but it don't look like no rock. Yeah, there's that one of like a figure with it with their arm. Yeah, have you seen that? It just looks like someone sat there. It looks almost like a mermaid. If that's a rock formation, like I don't see how how that formed naturally. It's very it's very strange. Well, yeah. I am on the fence with some stuff. I have so people have shown me stuff, mm. and I've like mm, I'm not seeing it because I do know that our brains struggle to see through chaos. It wants to see something it wants to create something for us patterns, to yeah. you know patterns and stuff mm -hmm. so i do think that uh there is a little bit of uh of trickery with our minds when we see some stuff i do think yeah. also that people present stuff and they don't they don't do the math they don't you know, i asked a question to somebody once that an intriguing picture it's an intriguing picture um but what was the camera it was taken with what was the distance what was the focal mm -hmm. length it was taken at what so we can work out actually how big things are in frame and all i got back was a lot of abuse and it wasn't directly directed at me it was more the fact that i was asking too many questions and i think with this you yeah. have to ask questions you it's like anything it's like any any paranormal anything you must question it and when you've asked all the questions you can ask whatever's left 
is possibly the answer you're looking for. That to me is a big part of being, you know, people say you've got to be open-minded yeah. about these things. A lot of those people who say you've got to be open-minded are never open-minded to the possibility that the, re the, the explanation is just something mundane and, you know, grounded in reality. A lot of people are so wedded to the paranormal idea that they won't consider anything else. And I, I've, I've, I've come across that reaction a lot where you, you try and think of a, not even try to debunk it. You just try and ask those sort of questions that you were just mentioning, just, just to sort of get them out of the way and, you know, to, you know, you, you, you've got to consider them first before you start considering something straight. And you, you get a reaction of like, it's like anger from people. And it's like, it's such a strange reaction. It's, it's almost as if they, it's almost as if you, you're trying to take away that belief that they've yeah. got, you know, it's, it's such a strange reaction I find, but, I think you've you've always got to look at the the most rational explanation, which is usually the non paranormal re uh, explanation first. Well, you want to, if you want to investigate and you want to be, uh, you know, if you want to move in these circles, you must you must be a little bit skeptical. You can't go into something yeah. that you believe in. If I say Tom, there's a house there and it's got an angry ghost of a lady that chucks pans and pops some pans at you, uh, you're just. I don't want you to go in that house and go. I'm expecting to have pots and pans chucked to me. I want you to go in that house and go, well, why Why is this happening? Let's see if we can see the reason behind it. You know, you've got to have a little bit of scepticism because it. otherwise you just, there's no point you doing it. There is a certain type of person who spends all day looking through the Mars rover photographs, mm -hmm. zooming in on every single rock, trying to find something yeah. weird. And then when they found it, it's like, they probably get that little like dopamine hit of yes i found something and then they'll post it online and you know if someone tries to come along and say well that's just a rock or how big you know what's the scale of this thing if you've considered that they'll mm. you know it'll, it, they'll get upset because you it's almost as if you're sort of denying their their efforts that they've gone to or something yeah I, i've asked that question many times on groups and i've been in, uh, on in groups where i've seen a picture and i thought that is interesting but what's the focal length of the camera? What's the distance of the camera from the object? And it's crickets. No, nothing. You get no yeah. response. Often when uh, you get a response from like NASA or some astronomer who's an expert and he says, oh, well, it's either the, the thing is usually like t t tiny, like a few millimeters across, or it's like miles yeah. big. It's like ridiculously big. And you just can't tell from there. Another thing they do is they'll they'll find these objects and they'll edit it in photoshop to make it more clear so they'll see something that looks like a figure on mm. something unusual and they'll they'll sort of color it in you know they won't alter the actual image but they'll they'll color it color it in slightly different to the background so that it stands yeah. out more so you can see what they're seeing so it, it looks more dramatic than it actually is the images that nasa do pop online are pretty poor considering the equipment they've got mm. up there uh, those images should be coming back you know, crystal clear, 4K HD, whatever. Yeah. Uh, they should be a completely like like you're stood there. And and I do think that the images that they get back, they they massively compress them. They turn all the contrast up. They turn all the brightness up. To if mm -hmm. there is any anomaly in that picture, it's completely washed out. And and just by get downloading the picture and uh, just re redoing the contrast and brightness. You can you normally see things that don't look right. Um, but the problem is, if you go in and see something and draw around it and then make that thing green or whatever, I'm I'm putting my interpretation on that image about what I want you to see. It's like me recording an EVP and going, Tom, I got an EVP and it says you're uh, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And you're now listening for that. Yeah. I'm going to give I should give you that EVP and go listen to that and tell me what you hear. It's like a Mars picture. I give you the picture and go, there's the picture. Tell me what you see. And if you're seeing what I'm seeing, then we can go to the next level. We can go to the next step. But don't. Yeah. I don't want to project my thought process onto you because once I do that, I'm actually wasting my time because I'm just, all I want then is a, a, a yes from you, you know, and that's the wrong way to do it. But that's my way. That I'm not. Everyone's different, yeah. but that's my way. Anyway, yeah, 
I mean, I, I appreciate all the people who are doing the uh, scouring. Oh yeah, photographs are strange things. Definitely, you know, just and like, you know, I, I I do think there might be something out there. In you know, Mars is an unusual place, and there's there's enough enough unusual like sightings and stories about that place that makes me think that it's worth you know it's not completely dead or at least uh it's worth it's worth considering that there could be something on there so you know well the mars the moon there's people out there doing some real diligent work but what's sad is that if you just get a person that just takes anything and go that's that that's that and just not doing any mm. critical thinking and just sticking it up on social media yeah you, what you're doing is you're you might be doing it for more likes or whatever but you're what you're doing is a disservice to those people out there that spend hours and hours and hours in front of their computers trying to do trying to do the right thing and find stuff that is undeniable that cannot be you know say it's just this or it's just that it, they they do the hard work yeah. and and as we know we cannot trust what nasa say we can't trust what the government tell you. You can't, and I'm not getting all conspiracy. I just say that they're going to tell you what they want to tell you, and you're not going to get a straight answer. So, you know, oh, NASA, isn't it? Uh, Richard Hoagland, never a straight answer. So there you go. But anyway, let's move on a little bit, because I want to get on to some of your stories, because obviously you went out there okay. and you got some interesting links. And we're going to go from, like, Mars now to sort of a, uh, might be fashion. Well, fashion's got something to do with it, but <laughs> but but let's just say let uh, we're going to go with the um the the seventeenth century painting. Tell us a little bit about that. All right, then. So this is a painting. It's in the National Gallery, and it's a portrait by the Dutch master Ferdinand Ball. So yeah, this was painted in the seventeenth century, and it shows it's basically it's a seventeenth century painting of a boy painted by a Dutch master. The boy stood there in his finery. He's got like some like red drapes over a table. It looks very fine wherever he is. You know, he, he must be some sort of nobility. But what's weird about it is that on his, he's got black shoes on. And when you zoom in, there's a Nike tick on, on his <laughs> shoes. And it's clearly there, definitely Nike. I don't know. Is it Nike or Nike? No, it was not. I don't know. I, I, I just, yeah. People know what we're on about. Yeah. So yeah, he's got he's got the swoosh on his on the side. Yeah, call it a swoosh shoe. It's not called a Nike. It's called a swoosh. Call it a swoosh. Yeah, yeah. I always say the tick, but yeah, I think it's meant to be the swoosh. And yeah, it's. I mean, the, the trainers don't look modern. They look like old-fashioned shoes. Probably what they wore in the 17th century. I don't know, but. They've just they've got the tick on the side. Well, it's the uh, ye oldy ye oldy swooshies, isn't it? It's the ye oldy night. It's the first yeah. generation. Uh, before they yeah. sort of uh, had computers, they had to design it by uh, drawing on uh, wax paper. So that's why they look a bit mm -hmm. old. But I was going to say, I'm um, I'm only joking. You know, I'm just being an idiot. But the the fact is that <laughs> um, we've got a lot of these things out there. There's a lot of pictures out there. Uh, the classic one with a guy in a crowd of people from the 1800s and it looks like um, uh, he's got a telephone. And there's another one with a lady that looks like she's got a, a telephone. But of course, in those days, they used to have yeah. these kind of uh, amplifiers that they would put in their ears because mm -hmm. uh, people were hard of hearing that to like basically put a horn in their ears to hear things. Uh, so I, I'm thinking there's a lot of yeah. You've got you've got that one of the guy and he's I, I don't know where where it was from like the the fifties or something and it looks like he's wearing modern yeah. He's clothes. got like a body warmer on. He's got like a hoodie and he's he's got a sh sunglasses on. He, he looks dead yeah. modern and people say that that's a time travel. Yeah. So I, I think that you know well there's lots of these pictures out there. But what I was going to say, um, obviously we we don't know if they are or they aren't. But um, uh. What would what I was going to say was fashion. Is that one of the main things that with fashion is it always repeats, and we've yeah. got this little swoosh on the on the shoe. I think what do you know what I think it is? I think it's a cutout. I think that it's a little cutout in the shoe, and he, what we're seeing is his little socks, his little uh, his yeah. little uh, yeah. his little dandy boy socks. That's what he's got on little little socks, and that's what we're seeing. I don't think it's actually on the shoe. As a as a little emblem, 
but I could be wrong. I'm just guessing. I'm making an educated guess. But when we talk about fashion, right, fashion always repeats. It always comes around again. When I was at school, which was a, quite a while ago, a few decades ago, um, what, what we used to wear, uh, our attire, our casuals uh, after school, or even at school, we would wear skin-tight trousers. Like, you'd buy a pair of skin-tight trousers from the market, and then you'd take it over and go, Ma, can you take these in a bit? They're a bit flared. And they're like, what? They're just, they're mm-hmm. like, they're, how do you get your, you know, can you take them in about an inch? So we would, you couldn't sit down in them. You would just, you couldn't bend your knees. So, um, yeah, we would uh, have stuff like that. We'd wear T-shirts, like polo shirts. Uh, we're very casual. So, but when you look back um, into the, when, the, when we left school and the time went on a little bit, and fashion changed. You had your Wrangler, your 501s, a little bit more baggier, a little bit more flared, and then you moved on a little bit into the to the late nineties where you had your your acid house and your your rave scene and all that, and you had your big bell bottoms. Uh, they they came back, mm. and then they were a thing back in the seventies, and you know, repeating once again. It's repeating, and then of course we move on into the modern age where we're all wearing skinny jeans again skinny little jeans yes. and trainers uh so i think with fashion uh, obviously we're not wearing pantaloons or anything you know the little kids got a little you know not, not yet. yet maybe it just hasn't come it hasn't come around maybe another 10 or 20 years and we will be where i'll be wearing pantaloons but and be quite fashionable but um what i'm thinking with footwear maybe that comes around more often and maybe the the nike the nike swoosh Maybe that was just a design back then that the, the you know, because shoes back then, they're all, there were no factories, all handmade. And the, the cobbler, he made these posh shoes. He knew it was going to a rich family. He thought, I'm going to put my mark on it. And he made the little swoosh because that was his mark. And then obviously Nike yeah. came along and thought, we need an emblem. Let's just do a, let's do it. You know, it's just coincidence. It's just coincidence. But of course, we look back and apparently time travel apparently yeah yeah i mean if anything it's an interesting bit of um like synchronicity a little bit of you know it's the, the fact that it's the fact that it's like it's on the side of his shoe and it, in the same know, place in a similar yeah yeah where they yeah. are on on a modern shoe i i mean i think it it's more like it's on the instep on the inside what does that tell you though tom shoe so what does that tell you what does that tell you about where we're living does it does that mean that does that mean that we are really in a simulation? Does that mean that everything this, you know, does that mean that I should no longer worry about getting up for work in the morning? Um, is this all, is it all this just a, is there a way out? Maybe uh, the back rooms, maybe we do, have, maybe there is a back room. Maybe we can go into the back rooms and that's the way out. We go to, maybe this is a lab. I mean, it could be, well, if, if, if we are in a simulation, right? It would save a lot of memory on the computer to just have the fashions repeat every few decades rather than having to constantly think up new clothing for every single human on the earth. It probably takes a lot of processing power having to think up all the different clothes that we're wearing. So just having us repeat the same style every, you know, every 30 years or so just comes back around. It's probably saving a lot of of memory. Yeah. Imagine how much hard drive space and how much memory you'd need billions of what what's bigger than a terabyte a gig gigabyte summer i don't know triple a bite a triple it i don't know i'm making words up now just to find something to explain what i'm you know what i mean yeah I, how big is the yeah, no. oh it could just be a very simple calculation which is uh you know how you've got like procedural generation where yeah in games you just you just have like a simple string of code and it generates like how the landscape looks and you can like keep generating worlds using this string of code because it's it just it tells like everywhere where to be yeah you know you can you generate vast like stories within these worlds just using a little string of code it could be something like that you know a little there's a little code running somewhere and it's just Everything else is just in our heads. So the countryside doesn't really exist. It only exists when we go to the countryside. 
because it's being written just before we get there. Oh, it's too mind boggling. Yeah. Oh. Uh, anyway, so, um, okay. So we've covered that quite thoroughly. Uh, so, you know, I want to move on because I'm keen to get to the, uh, to the next story because it is, uh, we had to have one because we had one before. Uh, it's a goblin story, but this one's a bit gruesome. I've seen oh, the yes. pictures. This one is a bit gruesome. Mm -hmm. Um, a, a, a goblin. So that, so basically a goblin fetus was found in a w old warehouse. This warehouse was being, uh, revamped, cleaned up and the builders were in, they were doing like a cleanup. They were moving everything out and the way they were, they were ripping up floorboards and, and uh, taking down walls and all the things you do when you restyle a building and they found well they called it a goblin fetus uh, well it was the local mayor yeah. i think uh it, it was in uh, santa maria regla which is a place in mexico and uh they were redo remodeling restyling this building and the kind of mayor took the story and kind of went with it and i saw the pictures have you you've seen the picture haven't you uh -huh. I don't think yeah. personally. I think it's an animal. What What do you think it might be? Yeah, it could be. A lot of the time, I've seen quite a few of these where they find supposedly like a mummified cryptid, and it usually turns out to be just an animal. You know, when animal bodies decay, they look. I reckon it from looking at it here, it could either be like a monkey or or a dog, a puppy. Just very because it's kind of squished yeah, yeah. down. It's it's almost like it's been pressed under something and its its body's deformed. So it's hard to tell what it originally was. I'd like to think it was a goblin, but I, I'm not sure. It does say in the story here they've taken te they've taken samples to determine a scientific explanation. So I guess that will tell us whether or not it is in fact a goblin. I, I've had enough of monkeys. I don't think it's going to be a monkey. I think it's a little. I think it's a, like a puppy or something that would uh, that, that yeah, I've got it does. It's... and uh, got mummified, died and got mummified, and over the years it got compressed and squashed, and um, mm -hmm. and then they found it, and they somebody said that looks like a goblin, and they told the mayor, and the mayor yeah, thought yeah. I could uh, get some press out of this, so I'm going to say it's a goblin. Uh, I don't think there's any more to it than that. I mean, I'm still open-minded about it being a goblin, and what I'm what I'm wondering is, when if they took a sample from a goblin and tested it, like, how would they know that it was a goblin? Like, they wouldn't be able to look at their DNA database and go, "Oh, it's goblin DNA." Yeah, pull up the goblin DNA so we can check against it. Yeah. Uh, where have we got it? Well, there was that baby goblin that fell out the tree watching those kids play football, mm -hmm. and he went to the emergency room and we took blood from him. So, <laughs> do it with that one exactly. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how it works, but wouldn't I mean? They'll probably if it really is a goblin, then it would just come back as un, unknown or undetermined. So we we wouldn't be anywhere closer to an explanation anyway. So true, it would just be un, 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 unidentified, wouldn't it? Unknown, mm. uh, or I'd just say like I haven't got a clue. Next, so I don't know. So that was just a little story because mm. uh, we had to get the goblin one in. And there's another little story that goes with that because it's more over here in the UK. Back in um, uh, 1981, the the laws on having animals changed. Now, I don't mean the laws on like having a dog or a cat or a hamster or whatever. I'm on about the laws because people who believe it or not, up to 1981 could have um, big animals, circus animals like leopards and stuff as a pet. Uh, you know, Jeffrey the leopard as your cat. And they changed, they changed those laws and a lot of people were a little bit worried because they didn't want the animals to be destroyed. They didn't want them put to sleep or whatever. So they said their goodbyes and took them to the, the countryside and let them out. It's all right, go for a little run, Jeffrey. I'll be back in a minute. And then they sped off. And he's like, where have you gone? I can't hunt. I've lived with you for 20 years. Where have you, have you abandoned me? <laughs> so, uh... I reckon a lot of these big cats that people were seeing in the 80s, because if you remember, there was a big phenomenon over here in the like 1980s where uh, big cats were being seen all over the place, like at Dartmoor and mm -hmm. all those kind of places. And Dartmoor is a, a big open expanse of, of green and forests and countryside over here. So it's people go walking there and camping and stuff. But I remember a story that I heard 
Uh, it was on a TV show of people telling their uh, experiences. And it was a couple. They'd been out one night. They were in the country. They'd been out one night. They, I don't know whether they were on holiday or whatnot, but they'd, they'd been out anyway. They'd had a, a beer and a, something to eat. And they were walking home. And they were, they'd were taken the, a shortcut through a, a pathway, which was in a kind of a secluded area. And as they walked up the pathway, they noticed something moving in the bushes to the side of them. And they looked, and they couldn't really see what it was, but they could see a pair of eyes. And they said it was about the height, like a, like a leopard, you know, a large dog, basically. And mm. as they tried to move slowly away, it jumped out at them, and it knocked the husband to the floor, and it also knocked the lady to the floor, but not as serious. And when she got up, when they got back to their car to go home, which was parked at the other end, she noticed a burning on her side. Her side was burning. And they looked down at her shirt. She was wearing a blouse and a, like a blazer. And her, blaze, her, her blouse was ripped and it was red. So whatever it was had uh, cut, cut her. They went straight to the hospital mm-hmm. and the hospital cleaned it and, and mended it. But they made a note of, they wanted to know how she, it happened. And she, they explained what had happened. And they said, well, they had a few doctors look at it and they said, well, this looks like claw marks. It looks like someone scratched you, but big claw marks, not yeah. like a cat or a dog, but these are big, like the, the size of your fingers, you know? And, um, yeah, to this day, they think it was, uh, they think it was like a, a, a leopard that had jumped out of the bushes at them, scratched at them and ran off wherever it was going. So, yeah, I do think yeah. there's a lot of those animals still out there that have, that have interbred and had baby leopards and whatnot panthers pumas mm. uh, and they're out there living in in the wild now the reason i say this is because recently a couple of cases where uh, farmers have had their sheep mutilated half eaten whatever out on the moors and they found hair on the barbed wire fences where something has got through the fence pushed its way through and they've had They've given this hair in and it's been tested and it's come back as leopard hair. So that kind of sense says that all you need to know that there's, there are these exotic animals that have gone out there in the wild and have made small communities and are still living out there. Yeah. I don't know how many. Yeah, it, lo- it looks like it. I mean, there must be, for them to be living out there, there's got to be a, a good number of them to be breeding yeah. and not get completely like inbred yeah. because if there was just like a couple of breeding pairs then you know the the gene yeah. would get They're so diluted yeah you'd need a good few around uh i mean if if it's a dna result proving it then it, it can't really be denied it's just i i mean i looked into this a little bit i did a video on this old um folklore story called black anise and i think that's down like by leeds way and I theorize that it could be, I mean, this this legend goes back hundreds of years and it's about like, uh, well, they, they said it was an old woman who lives in a cave, yeah. but they also called up Cat Anis and said she could turn into a cat. And I theorize that it could just be a big cat. You know, they could be, they could have been here for even longer than back in the 70s. You know, there could have been explorers bringing them back and from overseas back then. Uh, you know, so I theorized that it could have been a black cat and... Uh, like a big cat and I looked into the modern modern era and there was loads of sightings around that area of a black cat of a big black cat a panther type of thing but it, the the problem I, I have with it is you know when I looked into this this area where the cat was supposed to be it was so built up I, I really have a hard time seeing how a, f- a family you know enough to breed and keep breeding over over decades could be living in such a densely packed yeah. area and all we have are the odd one or two sightings. We have a couple of very, very blurry photographs or videos. We, we, uh, I've never seen like just a clear, you know, like when people go off into the jungle or the Serengeti or somewhere and film these like big cats, you know, really clear photograph or just anything other than that. Just these odd, very hard to prove sightings. I mean, this DNA evidence is the first, like, real proof we've had. And I, I just, 
I find it really hard to figure out how we can have these cats living in the countryside of England, which is such a, a small area yeah. and so much of it has been taken over by, you know, sub suburban spread. Like, I just don't understand how they can remain hidden for this long, you know, decades and decades. It's, it's such a strange thing, but I, I mean, they must be out there if this DNA proves it. So Yeah, I think the only thing I can think of is that they've always, as you say, they've always been there. And the only reason that they've able to be kept going is because they haven't died out. It's because everyone let their animals go uh, in the 80s. And of course, then there was more different animals to breed with. And that's why they were able to keep going. But as you say, a lot of these areas now have been populated, built up on, uh, are used by people, like dog walkers and on regular, you know, regular, they're there every day. Um, you would have thought by now. That, that is often, that is often the people who yeah. see them as dog walkers. So. I don't know. I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm still skeptical, but I'm also... I'm going to say I'm on the fence, but I think that it could be a possibility that there are exotic animals out there still alive and still living, but I don't think the numbers are, mm. are vast. I don't think there, there are like hundreds of them. I think it's literally just a, maybe a few dozen and they're so spread out mm. but that, that, that the likelihood of you seeing one is, is very unlikely unless yeah. they are starving to death and they have to come into a built-up area to look for food. But I don't think that'll be the case because there's enough food out there in the wild for them to live on. For example, rabbits, hares, small rodents. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, these these animals are born hunters. They know how to track and, and hunt small uh, prey. So I think there's enough out there. But it w mm -hmm. I don't think the numbers will be hundreds. Of I think there'll be small, very small communities, maybe a few in each one. Uh, who knows? I mean, they they do have like massive, like um, in the wild, they roam hundreds yeah. of miles. Like a single cat can roam hundreds yeah. of miles, so it wouldn't have to be like loads of them. It would just be, you know, if they were a self-sustaining colony, there would be need to be enough just to, like I say, keep the gene pool from stagnating. I suppose. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know a lot about biology, but I know that it has to be like. They can't keep interbreeding, no. can they? Or they'll end. They'll end up bit, genetically bit deformed. Yeah, genetically. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they'll, 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 they'll end up yeah. becoming all a bit. You know, have problems. Put it that way. Mm. They'll have problems. Anyway, yeah. moving on from big. I've, I mean, go on. I was going. I was going to add. What about the theory that they're paranormal well, in nature? I've heard that. Well, yeah. Okay. You know, they, that's why they remain out of sight. That they could be interdimensional or something. I've heard that theory. Yes. Um, then you're going into the, uh, well, you're in the cusp of folklore there because if you go back mm. like hundreds of years where, for example, there's the case of the church that was apparently uh, attacked by a, a devil dog and the, even to this day on the door there's scratch marks that apparently this devil dog had scratched into the door and they're still there. Whether that's folklore or a, just a story, I don't know. But you are in the realm of uh, beasts and that kind of paranormal bubble of where people come across these creatures and you think to yourself, are what they experience in, are they actual animals or are they an interpretation of something like a trickster? Uh, so mm. you go back in, you can step into the trickster pheno phenomenon where people have experiences and what they experience is a paranormal experience but it at the time it seems very real and something that they can process and understand it's not something that they don't know what it is so for example mm -hmm. if i'm an alien um and my mission if i choose to take it or not is to come to earth and write up a an essay on on human dog walkers and i know that in this area people walk their dogs but I also know that there's legends in this area that there are big black cats. And I've got a special watch on that can make me do anything. I can appear to anyone as I want. So for, for my mission, I am going to turn my watch and download a, a Puma app that I can push on. And when I'm out in the field, I'm a Puma. And everybody sees me as a black cat, you know. 
but I'm actually, yeah. I've got a notepad and I'm writing stuff because that's what I'm there to do. So is it paranormal? Is it something else? Possibly. It could be that kind of trickster thing. That's why they don't seem to be around all the time. That's why not everyone is seeing them because it's a certain kind of person that has to kind of trigger it for it to happen. You know, it goes back hundreds of years mm. when the whole devil dog thing and the black dog. I mean, there's the case of the um, the ghost club when they were investigating Borley Church and two investigators were sat oh, yeah. in the well, the outside bit of the church and they witnessed this dog, this large dog running up the road towards them and they said, it's going to jump the fence. And they actually heard it clatter into the fence, which at the time surrounded the church. And then they ran to the fence to see where it was and there was nothing there. So what was that? Mm, yeah. I really don't know. I mean, you you know, it could be. It could be some sort of paranormal thing. Yeah, I mean, as, I know it's a bit of a, it's a kind of, bit of a can of worms going down that route. It's just, a, a, it's something that I considered when talking about the big cat thing is, and that, that would explain why people see him, but then you never see like a good photograph of one or you never get one like caught in a trap or anything like that. It, you know, I've heard of people seeing them, um, you know, from reading some of Paul Sinclair's books of people seeing them around strange places like burial mounds and they'll see a cat go, like a big cat go across their path and disappear into a bush and then it'll just vanish like they won't see it anywhere or, you know, they'll see things like vanish in front of their eyes. Like these, these sometimes these sightings are accompanied by like a paranormal experience of strange lights in the sky you know they would there could be a paranormal it could it. be um i don't know when when all of the hysteria was on in the 80s they actually brought the army in and they brought of uh mm. a, a army some squad of army guys in to 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 hunt it down and find it for find these animals and mm. they they did catch sight of these uh animals and they couldn't they couldn't track them they couldn't find them so yeah mm. um <laughs> who knows it might be it might be that. It might be something a little bit more than just just a, you know, a black cat. It might be something more. It might be uh, playing with people. So, or it might be something connected with, you know, mythology. Who knows? I, I It's fascinating. Uh, but it's interesting that this hair, this hair samples that they've got, they can DNA test it and say it's this or it's that. But if you think about it, if it's able to, take on the form of something is that in itself a remnant of something that it never was but it was impersonate i don't know it's just your mind can just sort of explode from all that stuff so um yeah are you familiar with wonderland in uh in cleethorpes in i think it's grimsby up north are you familiar with that oh okay. no not okay really. so no. wonderland right was a um a place that was built back in the olden days 1926 it opened and it was yeah. on the seaside and if you could imagine the old the the old british seaside the, of the of the, the victorian era the early sort of 1900s where you would have a large area which was basically amusements uh you know you could go and see a, you know, a, a play you could have some to eat you could you know go and go on the uh the rides and the and stuff like that it was a bit like that because a lot of people back in them days they would go to the the seaside for their holiday like like here we had like western was a a massive victorian holiday destination it, it, thousands and thousands of people would come here from up from who lived up the country worked in the the mills on in the mines and they would come to here and do their holiday like you know like any of the coastal places because you know it you know, bit of sunshine bit of sea air and all that stuff Obviously, as time goes on, these places like they become run down, and they they're a kind of shadow of their original self. But apparently, this is another story from you. This was with a lady. Wasn't she out for a walk on the beach, and she saw a she took a photograph and saw this kind of ghostly was it a white what she interpreted as a white white lady or someone in a dress? 
Yeah, it's it. The photograph on the page is quite hard to see. I don't know. I don't know if she's got a better version of it because it looks almost just like a solid white blob in among the mist, yeah. and it's hard to really. Uh, it's hard to make out what it's meant to be. I mean, I'd I'd interpret it almost like a a woman in white type of figure. Mm. Yeah, but it's in the photo on the on the news site. It's hard to see. It's it's not very high resolution. It does look like a. It does look like a little white blob. I mean. I, I, it does look a little bit foggy, like like a fog. Um, it, apparently, it was moving uh, when she saw it. It was moving across, you know, her vision. So yeah, I don't know. Maybe it was some sort of. Some people say it was uh, like a, a weather phenomenon, something that uh, that was rare but was happening. It could be. I mean, it it could be some sort yeah. of weather phenomenon. I don't know about that. It looks too. To me, it looks too solid to be. Because it, it, yeah. It, I, I see what you mean because it's like it's very foggy yeah. and it could be like a bit of the mist that's become like coalesced in an area to me it looks too solid like i don't know i, I don't know every weather phenomena but it's i don't know it doesn't to me it doesn't look like it, it looks like it's an actual solid thing it's it's kind of creepy looking i'm i'm, I'm looking like to see if this page has like a source with a more high quality photo but uh well whilst you're looking for that i just want to add to it the, the yeah. wonderland is not it's still there the the area is still there um it's not obviously it's not it's a shadow of its former self it's now uh like an indoor market where you can go in and you know buy stuff and do a bit of shopping it's it's you know you people can still go there but it's it's nothing like it used to be but apparently in uh in the early days when it was uh, had arcades and amusements in there, they had they had a they had a ghost train, and um, there's apparently the the actual the Wonderland area is it's haunted by a this is this is a bit of a an irony this it's haunted by a man who isn't isn't uh, like an angry ghost or anything he's quite he doesn't bother you he just appears now and again but he's he was an, a worker who used to work in Wonderland. On the amusements, and he used to work on. No, I'm not. I'm not making this up. I'm not making. It, trust me. He used to work on the ghost train, and he had an accident on the ghost train, and now he's a ghost. Is that a true story? Or is I never. A, I, I'm not making. Like would I? Would I do that to you, Tom? Would I? I only ask <laughs> because I've heard very similar stories about the ghost train at Disneyland. Uh, yes, there's the ghosts of former workers there. I, I mean, I'm not accusing you of no, it. I'm just saying. Like, I'm relaying. Is it like I think I'm just relaying information. And I've also heard the uh, the ghost train at Blackpool Pleasure Beach is haunted. Uh, I think they did a most haunted episode by a there. ghost. Did the ghost be able? Did did the ghost actually work on the ghost train? I don't know. I I don't, I don't know what the ghost story is about the Blackpool one, but I'm sure there's something about that in the. Uh, the one at Disneyland. I'm not 100 percent sure, but I did a whole video on it once about the Disneyland. Disneyland. What the story? Um, now somebody's going to massively correct me because it's been a long time since I read up on this. There's a bit of um, uh, a mystery with Disneyland. There are certain uh, places in Disneyland that you you are not allowed to go. Even the employees aren't allowed to go. And these are doors uh, in in the in the park that are completely off limits. And you're you're not to go in them. Uh, they're com- you know they're, they're they're beyond staff only. They're not even staff only. And if you do try to access these areas, you get a properly telling off by those in charge. Um, but I can't remember all of the information behind it. But I remember reading about it a very long time ago, and it's some sort of yeah that really yeah it's some sort of mystery uh, of Disneyland, and it's also got something to do with missing people. And I just, people that have worked yeah. for Disneyland have just vanished. And um, I can't, I'll have to do the research and we'll have to do an episode on it, but I can't remember all the information off off the top of my head. But, um, yeah, I remember someone telling me something about it and something about there being like weird things carved into the wood. If you, if you look past those doors, but I can't remember the details. You know, it's a, you know, that rings a bell with me. Yeah. As well. A long time ago, I read about that and, uh, I watched some videos on it. I, I might, I might do some research this afternoon on that. But um, just it's some sort of uh, correlation with a with a theme park. 
But yeah, apparently this chap he worked on the ghost train back in the days when it was a uh, when it was a um, amusement place. And they had a ghost train in there, and there was an, an awful accident, and he got killed, lost his life, and now he's a ghost, and uh, he's a ghost who used to work on the ghost train, and he's not an angry ghost. He's quite a laid back ghost. He's very friendly. If you see him, he'll give you a nod. You know, all right there. But um, I would be, I would be quite angry. Going to work and getting losing my life on on in my job, on the ghost train, and now I'm a ghost. Is this some sort of joke? Is someone having a laugh? You know. Yeah, and this was at this was at the same place. Well, well, Cleethorpe, Cleethorpe's the same. Yeah, sort of Cleethorpe's is um, a, a coastal town if I'm correct and uh, Wonderland is the the main area where all of the amusements are it was like a a holiday area where you would have like down here we've got um, a place called Breen Leisure Park and you would go there you would have a holiday they've got like a, an activities area they've got arcades they've got they put on shows uh, and all that stuff and it's on the coast uh, so it's all, it's literally self-contained. You don't, I'm, I'm the kind of person, if I'm going to go for holiday, I'd rather go for holiday in a cabin in the woods, in the middle of nowhere, you know, don't, mm -hmm. I'm yeah. gone. I've vanished. I don't want to be on a park with a thousand other people. I don't want that. That's not my, that's not my imagination of a holiday. Uh, I don't want that. Some people want it. That's fine. But me, no, I want to be in the forest away from everyone so yeah but um yeah that's my canal yeah as well. so i'm just saying that uh i don't even know why i said that why did i say that tom what was i talking about because you i think you were talking about the cleese yeah the wonderland yeah it was a very busy place very popular contained and stuff. yeah mm. i went off on a bit of a tangent there. it looks familiar now i'm looking at pictures of it like I, I remember going on holiday somewhere when i was a kid and it was it looked a bit maybe like you that, went there. i don't know if it was Maybe, maybe. Have you ever been to a, uh, a, a, on a side note, have you ever been to a, have you ever had a holiday at a holiday park? Yeah, we used to do a lot when I was a kid. We used to go to Butlins in Petheli in Wales. And uh, about, and then growing up, we used to go camping to all different campsites. Like we had a big gang of like parents and their kids would all go together and it was good. The yeah. best holiday I ever had was a holiday with my mate and uh we had we both had two weeks off of work and this is back in the late 80s and he had he had he just passed his driving test and he had a he had a Volkswagen Golf 1.1 and we packed that car with a tent a, a big four man tent huge it was uh with a and you know the the awning and everything we had some money we had our like two weeks money and we bought a load of food and we had a campfire and all that stuff. We had sleeping bags. And we literally got in his car. And we just headed down the motorway to Devon, Bude, Penzance. And we just drove around for like two weeks. Just camping in different places. We Sometimes we camp in campsites. Sometimes we camp on the side of the road. Just in the middle of nowhere. And we went. We ended up one place, right? And we was camping. And it was in Cornwall. And you know the old tin mines? Uh, they're everywhere. Yeah. And there's warnings outside of all of Not all of them. Some of them are have, have got doors on them. But some of them mm -hmm. don't have doors on them. And you can you can go in them. But they've got big signs on... Well, I don't know about now, but back then you could. They had big signs on the outside saying, Warning, unsafe mine, do not enter. And of course, to someone who's, you know, a teenager... That's like saying, come on in, come on, come on. And uh, so we would, we went in this one mine, right? And it was about, we pulled off, the, we, we've been driving, right? We pulled off the side of the road and we were looking for somewhere to camp. So we found a place to pitch our tent. This tent was massive. So it, you know, it was orange as well. So it wasn't very uh, covert, it wasn't very stealth. But when we were in this kind of, it was like a, a wooded area, we found somewhere and, um, we found this mine and you know where there's little lights you could get you could put on your key ring you push the top of them and it was like it was just like a yeah. little bowl like yeah. little tiny LED well, not even a LED it was just a little a little uh, 
just like a little just like a bulb on the end and it was so it mm. was crap it was just not very good and we that's all they had on me and we went into this mine no mobile phones back then nothing like that we went into the mine and we walked into the mine and we got about halfway right it, from the entrance and it was it was this mine was this went just went down man it was just it it was a there was a track in there where they had like a trolley thing on it and it was just like and i had this little thing which i had to keep pushing because the, the bulb kept going out and um you know when you suddenly get scared you and they're like oh no not going any further it was like that we had this sudden rush of like fear and we were like now that and we were just making excuses like oh oh i'm a bit hungrier let's go back i'm a bit hungry let's go make some food you know we were like oh i'm scared it's like oh i'm a bit hungry Let, oh, oh what was that no let's go uh, somebody might take our tent so and then we left but I always wish to this day that we'd gone oh. further, just into the darkness a bit yeah. further. Um, uh, I don't, I don't know if I'd like that. But I'm, I'm a bit claustrophobic with stuff like that. I'd, I'd be too worried about taking a wrong turn. It was the way I'm getting it lost. Was, it was a, it wasn't like all flooded or nothing. It was all dry, but it was in the middle of the summer. But yeah. uh, no one around. There was no one around. Just me and him, and we were in this mine about halfway down. And you turn around, you could see like a little circle where the entrance was mm -hmm. we suddenly thought we both got a little bit scared but we didn't want to say we were scared so i think it was me or him said oh i'm a bit hungry let's go back and put a dinner on uh and then we like yeah let's go better better go back because our tent's there but i'd always wish now that i just thought nah let's just keep going a bit further let's go a bit further yeah i might have disappeared and there's lots of strange stories about those yeah. mines you know yeah it's the old old legends, legends, parallels, and goblins, and <laughs> the sightings and things down in those mines. Yeah, so I the the, the knockers they called it. Yeah, I don't know. I I just uh, I just from this day I just wish. I mean, all those kind of places now are all gated up. They're left. They're, they're all gated or they're backfilled or they're um they've been done up and there you can go in with a tour guide. Uh, but there was back then they were just everywhere and you could just they were walk. Some of them were blocked up. Some of them had doors on them. But there were lots of them up there that just didn't have nothing on them. They were just, you could just walk in. And this one didn't have anything on it. It was, uh, maybe they didn't put anything on it because it was literally in the middle of nowhere. Uh, country lane with a with a forest. We went into, well, with woods. And we parked the car, went into the woods, found a place to pitch the tent. And um, you can't do any of that now. You have somebody go, excuse me, uh, you can't stop there. You're, it says on here, section whatever. Yeah, back then it was a bit yeah. more fun. Yeah, there's still places in America. I, w I watch some videos of people going off into like the mountains oh, yeah. and exploring, exploring all. Oh yeah, and because they're a bit, you know, they're not as closed off up there. As, but um, it's not for me. I, 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 it, it's the fact that they can go down and down and down, and then they'll turn a corner, and then they'll be in another corridor that looks exactly the same as the one they were in, another tunnel, and then they'll turn right and go into another tunnel, and it's like I would be so scared of getting lost in there i'm I'm quite claustrophobic and the deeper in you go i can just imagine getting turned around and going up the wrong corridor trying to find my way out and just getting so lost and never finding my way out of there ever again and that like i can't imagine a worse fate to be honest well yeah that's always what i think about when i watch them videos they are um you have got you have got to like let people know where you're going and take all the proper gear with you. Yeah. You just can't just randomly uh, just you know go exploring. It's it is a bit of a dodgy thing to do. I mean, look at those those um uh, those potholers. I can't think where it was, but they went into the potholing and they got all stuck and the water was coming in. The naughty pot. And yeah, and, it, and they oh they yeah. drowned. They got they were stuck. They couldn't get out and. They left them all in there and just sealed the cave as a as a grave and put a plaque on it. They just yeah. couldn't get them out. There's a couple of that's nutty putty. Yes, and then there's there's one that I researched. I can't remember the name of the cave, but there was another one like that where you. Oh, the, it's just a long narrow tunnel that you crawl along, and it just filled with yeah, water. Yeah, uh, a guy in um yeah. was it America? They went potholing and he fell down. He fell down uh, front ways and got wedged, and they couldn't get him out. Uh, and he yeah. they were trying to pull him out by his feet, but he had a heart attack. Uh, so it's so dangerous. Yeah. It's so, but it's that kind of. I don't know whether it's a human thing. You, I don't. We don't like to be restricted. I don't like to. You know, if I don't, I don't like it. I don't like it when my arms are, mm. are not restricted. I like to be able to be be, be able to move. And uh, I always have that feeling of um, uh, like what I don't mind open spaces, but when I go into 
restrictive spaces, my kind of senses start kicking in where I don't want to be restricted too much. And I think that's kind of a thing that goes back to us in our old days of when we used to run around and, you know, tigers would chase us and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, anyway, so on that note, I think we've re- reached the end of this episode because we've covered about everything on this episode, nearly everything. We've gone for it. <laughs> no, it's been, a, it's been a real grab bag. I've been... uh, it's been, uh, but we've got a few, we've got plenty more. So what we're going to do, listeners, is we're going to do another one of these in a few weeks' time. We're gonna, Tom and I are going to get back together with some more weird stories. But if you want us to talk about anything in particular, then uh, go to theparatalkpodcast.com and there's a there's a little contact form on there, and write in what you want us to look at, and we'll go and investigate, and and then we'll we'll if it's relevant to what we're going to be talking about, we'll add it on the show, and, and we'll talk about it. We'll give you a little bit of a shout out. So uh, I think it makes it a bit more interactive with uh, listeners, so they can send us stuff. And if you've got any weird stories or any anything that's weird that's happened to you, then do that as well. Go and drop us an email, and so Tom and I can. Um, uh, talk about your weird experience, whatever it might be. Uh, you know, the scarier the better. Tom loves that sort of stuff. So, uh, how's the? Um, I was going to ask you, how's the gaming going? Yeah, it's all right. I'm having fun with it. Uh, basically, my Steam library. I've got so many games that I've never ever played that I just buy because I see them on sale. I turn on OBS and hit record and just play a random game that I haven't played before, and uh, it's helping me sort of get through my Steam library a bit more, so I'm I'm enjoying that. It's it's quite fun. I'm enjoying your your playthroughs of uh, these games. I like I like I like indie games. I like um, games that are a bit all, all obscure and off the wall. Uh, so I'm enjoying them. Yeah. And I I, I sort of recommend anyone that into uh, gaming go and check out Tom's channel. There'll be a link in the uh, show notes because uh, he's got some interesting stuff on there. Uh, anyway, so yeah, yeah. until. Um, uh, so I'm enjoyed myself. Uh, give us a like on any of your uh, uh, podcasting platforms. Uh, it always helps. A little bit of promotion here and there. A little bit of uh, a positive feedback always helps. Helps the show. Uh, Tom and I will return um, in a few weeks' time when we've got some more stories together. But um, until the next episode, thanks for listening. Talk to you soon. Mm-hmm.